way the reminder of got it. And then um, we are going live in five, four, three, two, one, and welcome back to Evaluative Clinical Science Rounds. I'm still Don Redelmeyer, and I begin with the usual Zoom etiquette lessons. Number one, please mute your microphone, uh, and, um, and we do encourage you to keep your video live. Uh, number two, please use the group chat function to signal your questions at the end. You, you don't have to type out your full question, but you just have to say, I've got a question, I'll then call upon you. Number three, please be gentle on our presenter. It is so difficult to come across properly on Zoom. When in doubt, give the presenter the benefit of the doubt. Number four, please be gentle on me when I mangle your name. It's not a sign of disrespect. It's only a reflection of my own incompetence, right, Peter? And then finally, let us all hope we make it to 1 p.m. without a technical glitch. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. All right, our presenter today is, is Dr. Peter Uni, who received his, his pre-medical education and then an MD training in medicine from the University of Bern, followed by internship and residency training in internal medicine throughout Switzerland and followed by a fellowship in social medicine from the University of, of Bristol. He's been all over the world. We are so lucky to have him in Ontario right now. Dr. Uni is a professor at the University of Toronto, the director of the Applied Health Research Center at the Li Ka Shing Knowledge Institute, as well as the former director of the Institute for uh, Social and Preventive Medicine in Bern. Many, many accomplishments. I was particularly impressed by over 400 publications, an H index of over 100, with a particular focus on the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, where indeed, he sits as a scientific director on the Ontario COVID-19 Scientific Advisory Committee, uh, a, a committee a table. Thanks very much for being with us again, Peter. Thanks for having me. So this is really preliminary, personal, and I'll just uh, try to give you a few insights over the next about 40 minutes or so. Correct, Donna, I have 40 minutes. You give me those. 40 minutes for you. 41. Okay, good. So, you know, uh, life was already quite interesting by June 22, 2020, but then, uh, you know, my trajectory was about to change completely when Stanley Brown, here was still a bit younger and not, you know, that signed by the pandemic as me. Um, basically, I uh, called me to uh, ask me whether I'd be ready to help build up the science advisory table and take over a scientific director. And after, uh, you know, discussions with my wife, we both didn't really quite know what we were, uh, you know, getting ourselves into. I said, OK, let's go for it. Um, we set it up, the science table, um, independently of the Ministry of Health and the Health Coordination Table, how it's called now. And you see all the um, the arrows that are dashed. We saw ourselves, you know, independently advising, but also being in direct uh, connection and communication. Way not two ways, but sometimes you also try to make it two ways. Um, with transparency and communication, really just being in the foreground of all of that, knowing for us, it was, was clear for Stanley and me, if we want to make this journey with the public, we need to, you know, have people aboard. They need to understand what we're thinking, why we're doing things that we're doing, and that they need to be able to trust us that we don't give political answers, but honest answers. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, set up our public we website at the beginning. There was um, were all these uh, pressers by Stainy. This has changed now over time. Um, a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, media commitments that uh, many of my colleagues and myself um, just did. And I'll start with the information. And uh, this slide probably just uh, refers to the uh, challenging situation that sometimes, you know, with this pandemic, in the absence of, you know, the best designs, 
generating evidence, it's a bit like stargazing sometimes, but still, you know, the stars are real. We need to gaze a bit and we can make something out of it that hopefully makes sense. And I'll just uh, move to uh, October 5th, 2020, when um, we were in trouble much, 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 much more than uh, what we are right now. Um, and the challenge was that in places like Toronto and Peel, numbers were going up quite considerably. And um, what the premier said at that time, and uh, I took that very seriously and personally, together with my colleagues, show me the evidence to suggest, you know, that we really should close indoor dining. And this was one of these key moments, just, you know, understanding a bit better how we would need to do that and learning, especially, you know, from, from the two co-chairs of the table, Stanley Brown and Brian Schwartz. Um, if you want to move something from A to B, everywhere, also in this province, you need a pincer and you need the pincer principle you know, with um, somebody acting from inside, this typically would be staying, talking to the cabinet also, uh, a, lo a lot of us, you know, talking to various stakeholders in the ministries, etc. But you also need the outside job with uh, somebody or several people just really being out there informing the public and really contributing to the public discussion. And I think this, this uh, pincer principle was and continues to be really, really important if we want to move things. What we then did um, after the premier was um, indicating that he needs to see evidence, we developed a narrative. <clears throat> we sat together, well, virtually we did so uh, on Saturday morning after he uh, indicated he would like to see evidence and considered it our task to make what to us was obvious visible to everybody. You know? So uh, here is one of the slides, you know, the, uh, the wave at that time, haha, <laughs> second wave projected here in comparison with peer jurisdictions where they were going and what would what, what be happening. Um, you know, pointing out towards the major, one of the major weaknesses we have, obviously in Canada in general, and especially in uh, the province of Ontario, which would be long-term care homes. Again, that we indeed would be in trouble based on everything you're seeing, number of outbreaks, number of active cases in residents and in staff. Remember, before the vaccines, it seems like improbable, but indeed this was the case. It's not that long ago. Uh, unfavorable trends regarding um, hospital ward beds occupied and ICU beds occupied, as you see here. And then this distinction, we always had the problem, this is now about to change or is changing already, um, with um, regions such as um, Peel and Toronto as regions with high transmission. And, you know, that we just really tried to make the point there that those regions most likely would need to be handled differently than the rest of the province. We learned as we, as, as we went then that in certain situations, if you have full lockdowns, you need to do that on a province-wide level. But then this was just about pointing out, look here, we really have explosive growth. And uh, we can triangulate that. And if we take wastewater in Ottawa, this was at the beginning when, when uh, we started to build up a wastewater surveillance program for the entire province, but Ottawa was already completely functional. You absolutely see the same as in the case numbers here. Ottawa was also struggling at the time. And uh, the problem was then, okay, show me the evidence that restaurants actually make a difference. If we close indoor dining, that this makes a difference. Remember, this was still relatively early in the pandemic. More and more evidence was then accumulating. And one of the best studies we had at that time was a case control study. And this case control study looked into um, expo uh, the, the, uh, the association of exposures such as indoor dining in restaurants or bar coffee shops um, with um, PCR positivity in a case control design. That's all we had at the time. If I were to present the data like that, you know, what would change? So what we did or what, uh, what I uh, suggested to do is, okay, we just 
look into what's happening if we use the estimates from this case control study, the adjusted odds ratios that you just saw, and apply those to regions with low, moderate, and high transmission, and try to figure out then what's happening now in the current situation over time if we would keep this exposure open or closed. And that's basically what you see here. You get the bang for the buck, obviously in regions with high transmission, but you don't have to annoy people in regions with low transmission as of yet, and you can keep indoor dining open. That's basically applying external evidence to the context of Ontario, as we started to understand that we probably would need to do it to make, again, these sorts of things as visible as we could. And this was also very much at the beginning of the uh, of this uh, story. You know, I remember we started in July, had our first meeting with the health coordination table end of July, and started to publish science briefs um, end of August, basically. So we also tried to convey at that time then, look, there's a need in association between the stringency of your public health measures. This sounds like trivial nowadays, but it wasn't at the time. And what's actually happening in your jurisdiction. And if you're in the yellow areas, basically with your um, stringency ind indexes, and you don't actually do very much against um, the, uh, the exponential growth in your jurisdiction, then you're in trouble and your case numbers are exploding, as we see it right now again in the Netherlands. And if you behave more um, like Victoria or uh, perhaps, you know, at least behave like Germany and your stringency index is orange at least towards the red, then things look considerably better. No, that's the story that we were uh, basically trying to convey. And remember the pincer principle. First, it was Staney um, who conveyed this story internally and had all the internal discussion. Then we went out to see it on October 9th, once we saw that we were all on the same page and no, nobody was blindsided. We went out with this presentation into uh, the public domain. And um, what happened then was that in high transmission areas on October the 10th, there was a closure of indoor dining and other high risk settings, you know. We could have done that much differently and probably no, nothing would have happened. The point here really is you need to have everybody aboard, not the not cases, but everybody as good as it gets there. Otherwise, things won't move. A few days later, um, we published this also. And, you know, to summarize all of that, to be honest with you, cost me as much as I typically invest for a New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet submission. You know, this is really tender loving care, trying to bring it to the point. It's a lot of work, uh, but just to take, you know, the situation seriously, this is not about impact factor, but hopefully impact in certain situations. Let's move on to January 11th. 2021. Um, before I start, I ask you a question. Don, you're the only one who needs to give me um, a, a response then immediately. Imagine you're uh, doing a deal with a bank and you invest $1 and the bank tells you it will double the amount every three days. You tell me right now how long it takes until you are a millionaire, Don. Oh, less than a month, I bet. Well, he's overdoing it, but most people will tell you something completely different. Obviously, less than a month is now really quite, quite aggressive here. It will take you 60 days, but most people will tell you in the public, including politicians, yeah, a year, two years, perhaps six months, but not 60 days. And that's the challenge we're talking about. Nobody understands exponential growth and that the pandemic feeds on itself. And uh, here that's uh, basically adapted from a lovely slide from, uh, from a BBC. That's the situation left in blue, what many people in the public think about, you know, I would consider this to be wishful or magical thinking and the situation in the right that nobody just actually can believe. If you basically would have left the wild type of the, of the, uh, of the virus 
completely uncontrolled during the first wave with a um, basic reproduction number of three at day 37. If we had uh, basically three cases at the beginning, we would have had um, 1.5 million cases here. This is more extreme than the situations we were in, uh, we were in just uh, before in the bank example that we have, but that's the challenge. Left, that's what is in people's mind. Right is what's happening and people can't believe it. We also saw that repeatedly during the pandemic in various jurisdictions, including our own. You know, We wanted to wait and see whether really what is uh, currently projected actually just happens. Yes, it happens if you don't do anything about it, but it doesn't have to if you react early. You know? And at that time, you know, we were sort of um, okay with just... just um, conveying the challenges of exponential growth and uh, discussing you know, the models that we basically gave in updates roughly every two weeks, typically. And um, you know, in the projection, when, when uh, the premier here said, okay, you will fall off the chair when you see the modeling, um, we basically conveyed some of that. That's from our internal dashboard here at the time. But the problem here is, again, you're on a certain trajectory. And if you are on the wrong tra trajectory and your um, effective reproduction number is quite a bit above one, it can go very quickly, you know, within a month that uh, perhaps 4,000 cases become 11 or 12,000 cases. The point is when you're in there and if you, when you start to take everybody seriously and understand, going out to the public and explain what's happening, that this is nothing else than public health in action, things can change considerably and immediately. And what we started, you know, just to, to uh, see as a pattern was that Staney typically did the, uh, the pressers at Queen's Park. And roughly at the same time, I started to, and this was entirely coincidental, it just happened that way. I started to uh, respond to questions from the audience on Ontario today, you know, just to convey what the problem is. I remember at that time, you know, that I was talking about the self-accelerating car that basically would get faster and faster and faster and you have a break, but this break takes two weeks until you start to see an effect of breaking. Uh, just to convey this story of exponential growth. You no. Know? And what basically happened there, there's of course, we know that now also a Christmas bump just in there, just in addition, but we were already on the wrong trajectory before Christmas. And then we bump up. People started to change their behavior dramatically. And rather than going up to 11 or 12,000 cases because before people, you know, potentially start to slowly adapt their behavior and things start to slow down and curse flatten, we actually made it downwards again but you know only for the next challenge of course to come on 16th of january 2021 i went out and uh, told um cbc uh, the house um that what i saw there with what we call the alpha variant now would be the single most scary thing I've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. And I meant it actually, you know, but you know, there I, I felt a bit like the, the boy who cried wolf. Was I too early with that when I actually was, was indicating, look, there's a problem that's coming. And the problem you'll see here, you know, the current variant in blue, that's a model coming from um, Queen's University from Troy Day. And uh, then the new variant, you know, that is down here, not doing much for quite some time. And then all of a sudden it starts to explode, depending on, uh, you know, which of the stochastic processes that actually kicks in a bit earlier or a bit later. But then when it starts to explode, we're all in trouble. At the same level of public health measures that worked before, it wouldn't work anymore. Task at hand how to make all of this visible, what to do. First thing, you know, in January, okay, indicate we have a problem, it's a major problem, it's big. Wasn't good enough, nothing what would, would happen. You know, developing a narrative then next, you know, so what I then try to develop is this pandemic within the pandemic. We have two pandemics now, and uh, if you look at the variants, things look different than when you look at the rest. And what I uh, introduced at the time was this, uh, this dashboard. 
you know, just to, uh, to show uh, here to the left that if you just look at the overall case numbers, things still look sort of okay. It's flat. And before we wonderfully just went down, but actually what you have in the background, in the hidden, it won't become obvious before um, the variants don't have, you know, a share of 50% of all cases is a complete Swiss federal disaster to the left and a complete control if you open up a bit, a bit more, you know, so lift uh, public health measures of the early wild type kind of strain, the, uh, the new, uh, the, the non VOCs as I called them there. And this was a major issue just to, you know, start to convey this message to everybody. Okay, the problem is to the left in orange, forget about blue, blue is not an issue anymore. And you know what we have seen there and then continuously uh, saw then later as well was evolution in action within the shortest time ever, you know, from beginning of December onwards, the alpha <coughs> variant took over the world. Not only Ontario, we typically earlier because we're connected with, uh, with the UK so heavily and the UK keeps messing up things considerably. So typically Ontario is earlier than uh, for instance, Quebec because our connection travel wisely is just uh, more intense now. But you know, that's basically what happened. Uh, all of a sudden the orange world becomes blue with alpha, but look at what happened next. And then it becomes orange again. You know, this is about what you see here is just the two mutations as markers and 501Y and the 484K. Um, after that, once more evolution kicking in, in real time nearly, it's absolutely not. The, uh, the variants just upping their game, first alpha, and you see the slope downwards and upwards. What alpha was for the wild type was delta for alpha, once more in here. And that's basically the transmissibility, the early strains that caused waves one and two in Europe and uh, North America had an R naught of three, roughly. We'll see what this uh, means in a moment. Alpha was about 1.5 times more transmissible and delta again compared to alpha once 1.5 times roughly more transmissible. This means R naught jumping from three. That's okay, you know, that's bit worse than influenza, but perhaps not that bad, to something which just doesn't behave as of yet, you know, just like one of the hypertransmissible viruses, but is actually pretty remarkable in the top league of transmissibility for respiratory diseases, absolutely, no? And what you see up there is what the R0 meant um, to the left here for the original virus, two to three cases were infected on average, on average emphasis, that is because we, we're having a Pareto distribution with a long tail to the left, uh, a lot of super spreader events that caused the pandemic, especially at the beginning and propagated the pandemic. So uh, two to three people, um, on average, being infected by a case with the original virus and all of a sudden an average of perhaps seven with Delta. Not only that, but um, the prognosis associated with getting infected would change to typically on average as compared with the original virus, a doubling of the risk of everything, hospitalization, ICU admission and death on average as a, as a ballpark, a factor of two more virulent. Now, what does un uncontrolled growth mean up to day 15? If you introduce a case for the early wild type kind of virus, alpha and delta, look at the numbers after 15 days as the number cross-section of daily infections, assuming a generation time of five days, when indeed it's probably 5.2 days, just for, uh, for didactical reasons here. You know, the early, the wild type was just like, you know, my mom, 82, just had a total joint replacement, very slow, not much happening. No? Alpha, you know, quite a bit faster, but now with Delta, we just have the Olympic sprint. After 15 days, if you leave the thing uncontrolled, you're in real trouble. That's what we're talking about. If you have a population which is um, still 
non-immune. And if you don't do anything, it's uncontrolled growth that we're talking about. And if you then just uh, go up to 28 days, look at the case numbers cumulatively now with a proper generation time of 5.2 days, 670 after 28 days with the wild type, 60,000 with Delta. That's the magnitude of the problem that we need to convey to decision makers and other people. That's what's happening. That was, you know, one of the slides that I did when I actually went to be on holidays in, I can't remember, July or August, just to make sure that people started to understand the magnitude of the problem is dramatic that we're having. And we obviously were able to convey some of that because as you know, we're one of the only places in the world that is not struggling, hasn't struggled uh, in the summer and is not struggling now with the Delta variant. This doubling time that you see on our dashboard, if you just go to, if you Google, uh, you know, science table dashboard, you'll find it immediately, is dedicated to the understanding of exponential growth. And I use the doubling time more and more just to explain to people what our current trajectory is and what will happen in 24 days from now in the example here with the average of 646 cases that this will double per day, you know, to roughly 1300 cases per day if we don't do anything about it and if nothing happens and things change because of changing behavior or weather, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe that so far, most of us, including our decision makers, um, you know, seem to be uh, on the same page with an understanding of the challenges we're having with exponential growth and with Delta in general. Look at what's happening nearly everywhere, even even Australia in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, the Australia that went for COVID zero, et cetera, struggled more than we did. They now go into the summer months and will probably again just be lower than we are. But what's happening right now compared to every other place in the Northern Hemisphere is actually still pretty amazing. We just need to be careful. So this was the first part of the talk relating to contextualizing and conveying scientific information. You noticed I didn't present any single randomized trial in this first part of the talk. And that's part of the game, you know, me being somebody who grew up with evidence-based medicine and representing evidence-based medicine, I have to acknowledge that evidence-based medicine, which is inherently conservative, will have to lower their standard considerably to get things done now during the pandemic. And some of the representatives of the field fell into the trap and just asked for randomized trials when asking for randomized trials would have meant literally millions of people on ICUs in hospitals and, you know, potentially dying. So let's now talk about misinformation rather than information in the second part of the talk. And just let's go uh, directly into um, some misinformation related to vaccines. First story, just to, to a, a bit illustrate what we're talking about, thanks to social media, especially Twitter, but not only Facebook as well, etc. Here you see it, um, people who are vaccinated are 745% more likely to die. And then people who are unvaccinated numbers are co coming from here. You see it. And, uh, you know, there was somebody doing the math, the denominator in green and the um, numerator in orange or yellow. And if you do the math, then you will see, OK, they are right. Indeed, 700 and um, what was it? 45 percent more likely. No. That's what happens if somebody just does number crunching and actually either do does it to be consciously misleading or does it because they don't have a clue. You know, that's what's happening in that. You know, not thinking about that at that time when this actually was, uh, was uh, you know, just uh, coming out. This was July 9th, 2021. Um, and uh, this was uh, for the period of 1st of February 2021 to 21st of June 2021. There was a quite considerable difference between um, the vaccine coverage in people who were at much higher risk, age wisely or comorbidity wisely, 
you know, uh, much more people in the uh, in the age group between 65 and, uh, you know, up to 100 or so, much more people vaccinated than younger age groups. And it's obviously we're all aware of that age that matters most in combination with the number of comorbid conditions. The more comorbid conditions you have, the higher your relative risk. What you're seeing here represented from these CDC display items are um, risk ratios. No. So what you obviously need if you want to make a claim about mortality, but, you know, that's not what is being conveyed on social media is randomized trials. And uh, if you would go, that's the first randomized trial I'm showing you, if you would go to the approval trial um, that actually established really well that it works in terms of preventing cases. Um, it doesn't help you uh, to uh, understand what happens with deaths because the entire trial had only accumulated, I think, five deaths overall, if I remember that correctly, two, three, four, five. So you can't do anything with that. So what do you need to do? You need to go somewhere else. And that's, again, evidence that accumulated over time and need to, to take just the next best. And here, the next best is really nearly as good as a trial. Miguel Hernan from Harvard and colleagues basically emulated the target trial. That's what they call it. And matched ongoingly, not only on age and sex, but also on important prognostic variables, including comorbidities, as you see here, ongoingly for each calendar day. And um, they started with, with uh, a lot of people up there. I can't see the numbers right now because Zoom is in front of it. And they made it eventually to uh, 1.2 million people that were much matched one to one. Now, what is important is to realize that you start to match just on age and sex, you fall into the trap of confounding by indication. Still, the vaccinated seem to be um, less exposed than the unvaccinated, even when you just match on age and sex alone. Um, and you need to match on more than just that. You need to do the full matching because what's happening here is that immediately from the moment when people get vaccinated, when the vaccine can't have any effect yet whatsoever um, on uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, you start to see a splitting of the two time to event curves can't be. So what Miguel Hernan and colleagues concluded is not good enough. We need to fully match. And if we match fully, we see these curves starting to divide only after two weeks. And that's the behavior in the absence of confounding. That's for symptomatic COVID-19, the curves here. And now I show you here the comparison of deaths, establishing that all what was distributed with uh, Twitter was just, we know that, of course, complete bogus. But you need to show the obvious. Remember what we talked about before. Next story, okay, vaccines increase the risk of myocarditis. I'm neurotic, therefore all these slides have an asterisk, you know, with uh, qualifying whether the statement is true or not. This one is true, but let's have a look more at that. Let's go back to Israel. Nearly the same group of people, again, with Mikhail Hernan and Mark uh, Lipsitch on the author list <coughs> on this New England Journal paper. And indeed, on average, across all age groups, the risk of myocarditis after two doses of an mRNA vaccine, it was Pfizer here, is uh, uh, increased by a factor of three, threefold increase. The point now is, remember what I said at the very beginning, you need to put all of that in context here. We need to put it uh, into context with the alternative. With Delta, there is no escape. You have two possibilities to get immune in the presence of the Delta variant, either through vaccination or through infection. If you don't get vaccinated, you will experience an infection. And if you get infected, your risk of myocarditis and also of pericarditis is much, much more than the risk that you have, which is very low, as we see in a moment, after an mRNA vaccine. And here, this, uh, there, there are different outcomes expressed here on an absolute scale, from acute kidney injury to deep vein thrombosis to arrhythmias to pulmonary embolism, etc. Look at the pattern. The evidence in favor of the vaccines, you know, through 
um, well-performed observational analysis is simply overwhelming. Also, when you address stuff like myocarditis, um, it's really the same story, just nearly everywhere. So this is a homemade one, but uh, you know we have we have an, uh, uh, an immunologist at the vet school in Guelph who became the hero of the anti-vax community because of that. So uh, the story here: spike protein is a toxin that circulates in the vaccinated. No, of course not. But let's see what's happening. Again, you know, Twitter is not necessarily our friend, uh, as we know, during a pandemic. There is evidence to suggest, says Nurse Erin, whoever Nurse Erin is. But, you know, she got a lot of reads and likes, etc. So let's have a look. This is uh, coming um, directly from this, uh, from this tweet, but this goes back to... Uh, to um, a file from an approval dossier. You see the, the stuff that was highlighted to the left, but what you see here to the right is that uh, the levels in the ovaries, that's one of the parts of the infertility myth, of course, which is also completely wrong, just to emphasize that, even though I won't go into details. Uh, the ovaries would show um, 0.095% of all the distribution, which is uh, next to nothing, uh, just to emphasize. And then the other part, which is important, this is not about spike protein, this is about lipids. You know, you, you uh, remember the nanoparticles, the lipid layers that are surrounding the mRNA uh, vaccine just to be able to introduce them into cells. Basically, that's the lipid concentrations and distributions of those. We're not talking about spike protein. Remember, we're introducing with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines just RNA, and we need to come to that in a moment. Um, then, you know, key burp, whoever key burp is, then said, I turned this into figures and look how amazing these figures are. Look at the ovaries again up there, you know, so the ovaries must really be a problem. And, you know, these vaccines... Sorry, sure. sorry. Somebody has unmuted their microphone. Can you mute again? Thank you. So uh, you see here what happens in the in the ovaries, blood plasma, whole blood, bone marrow, etc. But uh, somebody and I couldn't find the source exactly on the website byronbriddle.com. That's a website debunking this immunologist from Guelph. Um, just points out, um, look at that. That's basically the curves you've seen before are the curves down here that are hardly visible. No? So what do you think? Now let's go to the next story. You know, last time I checked, we were actually injecting into the deltoidios here. And the deltoidios is actually, um, as every other muscle and every other uh, place in the body, just uh, dominated by lymphatic vessels that go through it here. But um, what's happening is that if you actually just get the shot into the deltoid muscle, um, what's hit by the vaccine are the cells just around the injection. And the, then the, there's the intercellular fluid draining through the lymphatic system which goes into the deltoid and pectoral lymph nodes and the larger axillary lymph nodes where predominantly happens, you know, the uh, immunological reaction. Um, dear friend uh, uh, Brittle should actually know that, of course, he's an immunologist, unlike me, I'm just a general internist. Here are the, uh, are the lymphatic vessels. And what you would then see basically is that, you know, that in this area here, but also in some of the, of the uh, pectoral, um, lymph nodes, you would see most of the uh, of the uh, material of the RNA then just doing the magic. And let's have a look what then happens next. Vessels hardly existent, just you know, in this area, it's very difficult actually to hit the larger vessel in the pectoralis. That's why we use the pectoralis actually for injections. But let's now have a look next. This was part of the narrative there, and we just need to figure out how to handle this narrative. Um, so that's a study by Lay and colleagues in circulation research. They introduced a, a pseudovirus to Syrian hamsters, intratracheally. And uh, what they found was that, uh, you know, this uh, spike protein that was expressed resulted in lung damage and damaged endothelium. That's the point. 
And uh, this makes a lot of sense, you know, so the, uh, the virus enters also when it's a pseudovirus. Uh, and then uh, here it propagates and new viruses come out and they're being attacked and there's just a mess in the body um, that uh, results in a lot of loose spike proteins. And these spike proteins basically damage or contribute to damaging also the lungs and the endothelium of the vessels. It makes a lot of sense. Guess what? This was then part of the narr narrative of the toxins. Here then see basically what the immune response does. And just remember, there's not only an antibody mediated, but also a cellular uh, response with cytotoxic T cells. We need to look into those later because the, it's the cytotoxic T cells that destroy infectious cells that express the, uh, the spike protein. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And if you now just add an, an mRNA vaccine here, what happens is you get the cells to express um, spike proteins on their surfaces, but that's important. That's part of the game. They're membrane bound. You know, this is not just floating freely. That's on your own cells. So the, the, uh, the external protein that doesn't belong to your body is expressed on your own cells. Nothing free floating, nothing that could do the damage that we talked about. Now, when we talk about, you know, uh, what goes on here, there, this was the lipid, so something perhaps still made it into the blood vessels just here a little bit. If this is indeed the case, what you're seeing here, you know, that it made, makes it to uh, some other vessels, such as, uh, sorry, to, through the vessels to some other organs, such as kidneys, hearts, or um, the lung, or whatever, <coughs> what happens is, again, the mRNA triggers um spike proteins on the surface of the human cells and as i said before they anchor it in the membrane through the transmembrane anchor region that's the point that's where they're sitting no but if you then continue and just look at this uh, study here that also made it into the narrative by yogata and colleagues and um, then you find the um there is now also spike protein. S1 is the cleavage site, you know, um, S1, S2. The peak levels you see here, peak levels for, uh, for a spike at 68 picogram per milliliter and 62 picogram per milliliter. No nucleocapsid because that's a negative control. If there were an infection, we also would detect nucleocapsid, but this must be related to the vaccine that people have. So there is something, it's not just the lipids, there's something else. But let's go back, look at that once more. That's the peak levels, picograms per milliliter. Let's look back and look at Lay and colleagues in the Syrian hamsters. What was their concentration? It was four micrograms per milliliter. So what we see here is the four micrograms per milliliter versus the 6.8 or the 68 picograms, picograms per milliliter. So the concentration in the study by Okato et al. is basically 60,000 times lower only. This gets forgotten on Twitter. No? And what probably happened is, this is not completely clear, is that there are small spike protein leaks during the destruction of cells that are actually expressing the spike protein as a result of the vaccination. That's all what's happening. An additional safeguard, if you just want to do that very thoroughly, is what you're seeing here. There are mutations introduced in the vaccine that leave the um, spike protein in a folded conformation that is unable to fuse with the cell. So basically this folding here is what is attractive from an immunological perspective to trigger antibodies, but also the folding which is fixed prevents the spike protein that is triggered by the vaccine to fuse with cells and create damage in addition after it was expressed on the cell triggered by the mRNA. That's the entire story there. That would be the story that should be on Twitter, but it's not, of course, what you hear from anti-vaxxers. 
So let's now, about the last few minutes, um, let's just think about the victims of misinformation a bit and start first with those people who pretend that the Earth is flat and that the Apollo mission never happened, no? If you pretend the Earth is flat, you need a full-blown narrative that incl includes all the flatness and explains all the flatness of the Earth. You know, it's an entire world for you. If you have a conspiracy theory, if you lie, your lie must be big and it must cover everything. That's why you don't only hear about one thing, but everything. You know, it's planned. Everybody is bought, including myself here and all of you listening to me right now. You know, by whom? You know, by big global something typically and um, it's not worse than flu there was never a virus isolated ct values above 30 doesn't mean anything you know they're all false positives ivermectin they only don't want ivermectin because of global uh, pharmaceutical companies same for hydroxychloroquine of course and you know they're now having all this genetic therapy that they call vaccines which is just you know we hear that again and again again and again, the experimental injections. That's basically the conspiracy theory full blown. And you always get the full package if you have somebody who is actually just in this camp. No? And what then happens is very simple. At the beginning of the discussion, that can also happen in the media, especially you know, in European countries, you see that quite frequently, they suggest that there's a legitimate scientific debate. And if you don't contradict this first statement, and if you don't say that's not true, there's a scientific consensus. What you just said is all wrong. What happens next is they just ramble, miscite and distort scientific information and you're done. You can't do anything about that anymore. You know, they're very eloquent typically. So forget about all of that. But you, so you see, now we should talk about the victims. That's not the victims. That's just the people with the worldviews and the beliefs. You need to let them go. Some of them will then uh, unfortunately learn it the hard way if they get infected, if they haven't done so. And perhaps they're lucky, that's okay too. But there are people other than that. And you know, for me, the penny dropped when I um, read this headline relatively, relatively uh, recently. Moscow locking down and, you know, a very low vaccine coverage. When I thought of Eleanor, my wife here to the left, she, I grew up in Switzerland. She grew up in a, in a communist country in Slovakia. Um, we lived in Switzerland before. When I was approaching the authorities, uh, the administration, etc., I always expected to be helped. It's uncomplicated. Everything is just fine. And I went there very proactively. She was scared because she knew she could be in trouble with the authorities and something could happen. And they, she always tried to avoid that. That's a perspective of an Eastern immigrant. And of course, this can get much worse. Now, imagine you're right now in Moscow and the only vaccine available is this vaccine here, Sputnik V. Basically, even though the trial was published in The Lancet, do I trust the trial? No, I don't, because I know how things could go terribly wrong in Russia with the system that they're having and with Putin in charge. No? So what I would ask you when I think about my wife, Elena, you know, how socialized she was against, you know, the authorities and distrusting the authorities and how I am socialized as a trialist to distrust the Sputnik V trial, would I actually get the vaccine? This attitude that I have against Sputnik V, that's the attitude many people out there have who have experienced oppression in the past, systemic racism in the past, or other discrimination. You know, like Brian Sinclair that we all are aware of here, who eventually, after other aspects of uh, systemic racism played a role in his uh, leg amputation, ended up dead after 34 hours in an emergency room. The indigenous population is one of the population that rightly so distrusts our system. And not surprisingly, the indigenous population here in Toronto has a much lower vaccine coverage than the average in Toronto or in Ontario. No? That's the challenge. And what really pains me is when you then look at who predominantly is distributing malinformation or misinformation or disinformation, it's predominantly white privileged people like the top four of the disinformation dozen, they're all white. 
Last slide before I come to the conclusion here. These last few slides show you in a place like Ontario, it's not good enough to say everybody has had an opportunity to get vaccinated and we're done. Um, it's not good enough. What we need to do in this situation is to go the last mile and continue to counteract this information and continue to bring grassroots and proper information to those who have experienced oppression and systemic racism in the past. It's not good enough what we're doing right now. We can be better. We're already good, but we have important pockets of people who we can still reach with information and vaccines. Conclusions, um, probably a lot of what went on here is just related to this being a pandemic. No, that's my favorite cartoon in German. You can read it yourself here. We have rearranged the layout, travel books, are now in the fantasy section, politics can be found under science fiction and the epidemiology is among do-it-yourself books. You know, all the epidemiology on Twitter, you know, by some of these, you know, problematic people, that's just all do-it-yourself nonsense. If you get involved in that, you really need to know what you're doing. You need to really care. You need to get down all the rabbit holes, you know, like the story with uh, the toxic um, spike protein that is not. There's always, you know, this kernel of truth, minimal, and you just need to disentangle what is actually the kernel of truth and what's everything else. If somebody just talks untruth, you just need to speak up and mistakes will happen everywhere because being in a pandemic is not fun for anybody, including our elected decision makers. You need just one-on-one research and methods, no more. You know, that's mostly beginners levels. We need to show the obvious. You know, if you think it's trivial, then it's just about right. You always need to put data into context. Let go of the people with cult-like beliefs. You can't do anything. Life will look after that. Uh, but there are a lot of victims of disinformation with reasons to distrust the system. You need to reach them. We need to do that. We need to put ourselves into other shoes when we do any of you know, the communication we're doing. And we really need to be clear with our communication. That's what Tai Hoon actually was pointing out, I really tried to be as clear as I can, you know, so uh, that's basically what gave me the Thai's uh, gold medal in uh, communication. Completely out of control, the pandemic, you can't uh, save uh, ourselves through vaccines from the third wave. And yeah, sometimes indoor dining is not a good idea. Right now, we're still okay. But, where, you know, just looking at the Twitter bird uh, to the left here, talking about social media, and then I finished, Think about all of that, what we did, how much we're at, you know, the edge of a nervous breakdown, every single one of us, we're all exhausted, etc. You know, think about social media. The most important part is just stop polarizing. We all make mistakes. We're all humans and we're all in the same shoes. Thank you. Fantastic presentation, Peter. We've got time for questions. First up is uh, uh, Candace McNaughton, followed by Alison Paprisa, followed by Michael Schul, followed maybe by me. All right, uh, uh, Candace, you're first. Uh, this was really um, great to listen to. Um, thank you so much for running through uh, the prior experience. One thing uh, that was really striking is uh, that the paper that you mentioned about indoor dining uh, was written by a colleague of mine uh, uh, based on some research that was done in the United States. Uh, and that data did not have the impact uh, in the United States that it did here in Ontario. It wasn't utilized um, in a way that was effective. And you talked about this briefly, but can you help us understand exactly how you used the data in a way that communicated and spoke to the local leadership? Was it in figures? How did you tell yes. that story? Yeah, so it's basically, you know, it's the 101 of a clinical epi. You have a relative risk and it's meaningless for clinicians and you need to make these absolute estimates and the absolute estimates depend on the baseline risk. That's the theory behind it. So what did we do? We basically just have, um, we calculate risks for low transmission, moderate transmission and high transmission areas. We translate these risks into odds and we then apply the odds ratio of the case control study to the risks in the three different areas. 
and then just find out what happens with or without the exposition of indoor dining. And then we show simple bar charts that show, oh, if you are actually in a high transmission area such as Toronto, if you actually eliminate the exposure, things look better. And it needs to be as simple as that. These bar charts, I came to love them. You know, when you look at our, especially those, those science briefs where I got involved more, you always find somewhere one or two of these bar charts because that's what be, is being picked up by the media. Everybody understands it. It's simple. That's it. Great response. All right, but the importance of visuals. Allison, you're next. I'll go ahead and unmute. Hey, Peter. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. And I, I type my question into the chat in case that's more helpful. It's basically about these articles that I'm reading that are talking about the pandemic endgame in a different way. And they're questioning, you know, what are we after here? Are we trying to decrease cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and how that might change our activity? And I'm wondering if this is also happening at the COVID science table and, and maybe how the discussions and are shifting over time. Yes, we already had a few, uh, as Michael uh, Schull can, can, uh, can uh, witness, um, we already had a few discussions related to you know, this transition into endemicity. And uh, the point really is what we need to be aware of right now, since we still have about 85% of the population that is eligible, that is not fully vaccinated, this could still cause as many. That's a number uh, where social media criticized me, this can't be, but it's actually true. This can still cause as many as 15,000 ICU admissions to people out there with their age structures who are not vaccinated. So it's foolhardy for them to be not vaccinated and actually a Russian roulette. And right now, we need to make it through the winter, you know, with all of us moving indoors, vaccinating even more people, of course, getting then the kids vaccinated, reaching all those who experienced oppression and systemic racism in the past as good as we can and make it into spring and then spring will help. It will help that much that we probably will be able just to flatten the curve and still lift the, uh, the, the uh, public health measures. So after that period in, in, uh, from April or May onwards, I would start to believe that we can just let it go with a, a third dose vaccine rollout, with next boosters, et cetera, then in autumn. And uh, hopefully without new variants that are, you know, completely immune evasive or so, that would be a problem. And once we let it go, what does this mean? We will move those people who are not vaccinated into immunity through infection without overburdening our healthcare system, which will be tragic, but inevitable. All right, well, that's foresighted. All right, Michael Schuel, uh, 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 you next, go ahead and unmute. Hey, Peter, thank you. Great presentation. Um, but I, I just want to start by saying, you know, I joined the science table late uh, or midway through its um, uh, work, but I, I do want to thank you, uh, make a point of thanking you publicly for your leadership and your work, endless, tireless work uh, uh, as part of that, as one of the co-leads. I mean, truly, it's been magnificent to see you in action. And today was an example of that. But my question is actually more, I'm wondering whether you now looking back and you know, we're still, in the, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, you've obviously dealt a lot with decision makers and you talked a lot about the sort of the disinformation, misinformation class, but you've also been dealing with government and folks in public health and decision makers who've had to make the calls along the way about restrictions and vaccine rules. And I know you've been critical at times and rightly so. I wonder though, do you feel any sympathy kind of looking now at them and the roles that, and the decisions they have to make and the various forces they're under and how they behave, let's say, whether it's Ontario or other provinces or even elsewhere, but let me focus on Ontario because it's closest to home, whether you feel any sort of, I, I'm not even asking you to, to say you're, you're sympathetic, but rather, how do you reflect on the role that they are in and the shoes that they have to fill through this pandemic and the, and, and the various ways that's, that's played out? Oh, I find this absolutely challenging for every single one of them. And it's very clear when you look around the world, nearly all the politicians are struggling. It's very challenging. And I completely understand what goes on. You know, I have... I have 26 years of professional experience in my backpack and I felt like med school again at the beginning. So how do you feel if you're just accustomed to a completely different setup, etc.? You know, there was this story, remember that when we were in the third wave and I somewhere, I was actually just coming out of sleep and they called me and I had to go on the radio when we talked about that. I genuinely, I thought about 
uh, with the with the third wave whether I should step down from my role. But the reason mm-hmm. that I thought about stepping down was that I felt like I had failed to convey the message properly to them. That's the point. I really feel like this is so tremendously difficult. Look at Denmark, for for example. Denmark did so well for a very long time. And now they fell into the trap and just pretend that the pandemic is over. This is just normal. We're all humans. We don't have all the same background. Our role as scientists is to show the obvious. That's the point. And sometimes we can do it better and sometimes worse. We can't do the job if we just start to think, oh, you know, we are, I, I was when I was a young scientist. I remember that, you know, at the beginning of 2000, I was thinking in, in black and white. I let that go a long time ago because it's simply not helpful. We all make mistakes and it's very difficult for them. And on that humble and forgiving tone, we will end. It's one o'clock. Thanks very much, everybody. That's great. Thanks a lot. Well done. Thanks.